there have been great communicators here at TEDx Zurich, but the best one of them all never has been on the stage yet. And that's not me, but this lovely little tomato plant. <laughs> so I want to tell you about the plants, amazing communication and networking skills, and then look at possible consequences. The plant communicates with fragrances. So when a caterpillar attacks a leaf, the plant starts to produce leaf toxins, and at the same time, she releases a cloud of fragrances to warn the neighboring tomatoes so they can too start with their defense. The fragrances are methyl jasmonates, a scent well known in the perfume industry, so the female researchers were told not to use Chanel 5 because it would have confused the tomatoes. For us, it's a lovely scent, but for the tomatoes, it means attention, predators are attacking. <laughs> a little later on, this tomato produces different scents, and this time it is to attract beneficial insects for her defense. And the amazing thing is that the tomato not only knows that she is being attacked, but exactly who is attacking her. If she is attacked by spider mites, she produces a fragrance cocktail to attract predatory mites. They eat the spider mites. But if she is attacked by caterpillars, she produces a slightly different cocktail of fragrances to attract parasitic wasps. But how does the tomato plant know who is attacking her? She can identify the saliva. So the plant tastes the saliva of the insect and then produces a fragrance to attract the right bodyguard. What a great feat of communication. Another example. When apple trees are attacked or infested by caterpillars, such as the small winter moth, they release a fragrance cocktail to attract great tit birds. The birds smell the SOS signals of the attacked apple tree and thus find themselves a fat catch of caterpillars. I was fascinated by this world of plants and I started a career as an author. I visited many researchers and experts all through Europe and also in India, Kenya, and uh, Egypt, and of course also in Basel, my hometown. The researchers told me that all plants communicate with fragrances. They warn each other of a coming danger, they allure beneficial insects, they send out SOS signals, they even coordinate the behavior among themselves. And their vocabulary is immense. So far, about a thousand fragrance compounds have been uh, identified, five to ten of which are common to all plants. Well, plants can do more. They can perceive about 20 environmental signals more than we humans. Like humans, they can respond to smell, taste, touch, sight and sound. And like birds, they sense electromagnetic waves. And under the ground, there's a communication too. If you look at a forest, you see individual trees, an oak tree, a fir, a birch tree. But if you look underground, you see that the roots of the trees connect with fungi to build a huge, vast, dynamic net, a net called mycorrhiza, which means fungi roots and grease in science, this net is referred to as the WWW, the Wood Wide Web, instead of the World Wide Web. <laughs> also, most non-forest plants build mycorrhiza nets with fungi not visible for us. And research has shown that plants even exchange nutrients among themselves within the mycorrhiza net. So, in good mi uh, mixed cultures, as often seen in traditional agriculture, plants could build something like a dynamic underground marketplace 
where plants with long roots contribute water to the net, other ones nitrogen or phosphate or sugar compounds. So it's a constant give and take within the plant community. And sometimes it's a battle too. For example, marigolds, they sweat a toxic substance through the roots into the net to impede other plants to grow. And as new studies shown, the plants even exchange information through this net. So it's like an internet under our feet. Knowing all this, when I'm walking through a forest, uh, there is a constant whispering and murmuring, a whispering of fragrances I do not understand. And under my feet, there is a constant exchange of nutrients and information. And knowing all this gives me a completely different feeling. It's not me here, isolated, and tree, and tree, and tree, but it's the strong feeling that I'm too connected in this intricate web of life all around me. Plants can do more. They remember past events and learn from experience. Well, learning is a fuzzy concept. One definition goes that learning occurs when a living being remembers a past event and can change later on its behavior accordingly. Well, this tomato plant can do exactly that. When attacked by a caterpillar, she starts to produce leaf toxins, we already know. But the second time, a few days later, she can produce them much faster and more efficiently. So she remembered the first attack and learned how to deal with it in a better way. Most plants, perhaps all plants, can do that. Birch trees were found to remember a past event for as long as four years. I have trouble remembering something for four days and it's getting worse, but four years. Well, to sum up, plants are by no means passive living automatons, always reacting in the same way and following their genetic program. While this notion is still held within the scientific community, the contrary is true. Plants communicate above and below ground. They engage in lively relationship with their peers and environment. They harass others, they build alliances, they remember, they learn. And some scientists even think they are intelligent. And philosophically speaking, we could say, a plant is not an object, an it, but rather a sensitive living being, a she. So, the more we know, the more our, pick, our image of the plant is turned upside down. Question is, what are the implications of these new insights? I see mainly two. First, Aren't we on the wrong track with agriculture? Shouldn't we use these insights for a better agro-system? We could warn plants with fragrances of a coming attack, help them build microrhythm nets, um, boost their immune system, develop good mixed cultures, or with wildflowers, lure beneficial insects into the fields. So it's the plants themselves that, that offers us a great hope for the future if we observe them carefully and help them develop their skills. But by growing them in monocultures, we deprive them of the social context and we utterly neglect their communication skills. What about our relationship with plants? Does it matter? I had ample opportunity to discuss this question in Switzerland because Switzerland is the only country worldwide whose constitution maintains that the dignity of living beings has to be respected. Plants are living beings, so they have a dignity, but what does it mean? The Swiss government came to the Federal Ethics Committee on Non-Human Biotechnology, of which I was a member, and ask us to clarify the meaning of dignity in regard to plants. Difficult. But dignity could be a sign 
a metaphor that plants have a value of their own, independent of human interests. So, if we look at plants as living automatons, following a set program and only satisfying our interest and demands, such a notion would be absurd, it doesn't make sense. But if we look at plants as excellent networkers, even capable of subjective perceptions, having a life of their own, then it makes sense to say, yes, they have dignity. So, you know, when we look at the animals, for, for a long time animals were regarded as soulless machines too, and it was just in the last few decades that they escaped this mechanistic trap. And today, today society agrees, yes, animals have at least some dignity. With plants, we are miles away from this point. So in the ethics committee, we concentrated on the question whether we should respect plants out of, of, for their own sake, independent of their usefulness, that we could call dignity. Well, in the end, we agreed on one point. Um, plants should not be harmed in an arbitrary way. Arbitrary injury or destruction of a plant is a violation of their dignity. But we couldn't agree on the arbitrary. For some, it meant the senseless picking of a roadside dandelion. For others, I among them, the total and massive industrialization of plants. So, after four years of discussion, in 2008 it was, we published a report, and soon afterwards we received the IG Nobel Prize for this report. IG stands for Ig Nobel. It's a prize for particularly ridiculous research, <laughs> which makes people laugh, and then later on think. We were proud to receive this prize, and a member of our commission flew to Harvard to get it. <laughs> but that is just the very, very beginning. I'm convinced that we urgently need some limit against their total industrialization, that we, that we as humans have some responsibility toward plants. And of course, it doesn't mean that we should not eat, cut, grow, mow, or graft plants, or do research with them. That is not the point. Similarly, giving animals some dignity didn't mean we take them out of the food chain, or we forbid, or we forbid animal research. But, in my view, some forms of genetic engineering, not all, violate their dignity. For example, manipulations to render plants sterile for mere commercial interests, or patents on plants violate their dignity. Furthermore, plants should have some degree of independence regarding their adaptation and uh, propagation, as well as the survival of their own species. After having discussed dignity for such a long time, I came to love this expression. It's more than respect or value. If I would ask you for more respect for this tomato plant, nobody would bother or object. But dignity, dignity is a provocation, and that is good. And maybe, maybe in a few years, we will all laugh together, as predicted by the IG Nobel Prize, and it then will be a laugh about our arrogance as humans. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.